after Final Fantasy IX was released on the Sony PlayStation in 2000, the 32-bit era of Final Fantasy came to a close. Fans of the series wondered what would come next for the franchise, and Squaresoft aimed to deliver. When Final Fantasy X was released for the PlayStation 2 in 2001, fans were blown away by the title's breathtaking graphics, amazing characters, groundbreaking music, and fantastic gameplay. The greatest of all the game's redeemable features, however, may have been its underlying story. With this in mind, this video aims to provide a complete, concise, chronological storyline explanation for the entirety of the game. To this end, official game footage and artwork will be used. And now, let's get into the tale. 1,000 years ago, two great powers, Xanarkand and Bevel, were engaged in a great war with each other. Bevel used powerful mechanical technology called Machina, which eventually overpowered Xanarkand. In desperation, Yu Yevon, a great summoner and leader of Xanarkand, responded with an attempt to save his civilization. He turned his people's survivors into faith, souls that were trapped into a dreamlike state. In addition, Yu Yevon preserved an idealized version of Xanarkand called Dream Xanarkand. To protect it, he summoned a gigantic creature of unspeakable power called Sin which formed around him. To preserve Dream Xanarkand, Sin was designed to use its monstrous power to destroy cities using Machina, preventing anyone in the world of Spira from discovering Dream Xanarkand. Sin's immeasurable power eventually grew beyond the control of Yu Yevon, who lost control of his own mind. Sin engaged in a crusade of destruction in Spira, beginning with the absolute obliteration of the true Xanarkand. However, Yu Yevon left behind one method to temporarily impede the creature, if a summoner consummates a pilgrimage and destroys Sin, the Aeon used for the final summoning is possessed by Yu Yevon and used to rebuild Sin over the course of time. The period in which this takes place is known as the Calm, a time when Sin is docile and regenerating. As time passed by, a religion called Yevon was created, inspired by Yu Yevon himself. However, the adherents do not realize that they serve the one that was ultimately responsible for Spira's cycle of destruction. As time went on, a separate tribe of people called the Al-Bed developed their own language and began to use Machina in contradiction to Yevon's teachings. Periodically, several summoners were able to subdue Sin. The first of these was Unaleska, a survivor of Xanarkand who defeated the monster through the sacrifice of Zeon, her husband, who transformed himself into the final Aeon. Unaleska died in the process, and as an unsent, remained in the Xanarkand Dome where she greeted each future summoner and explained the grim reality of the final summoning. After each calm, Sin always returned from his slumber to threaten Spira once again. Many years later, a man from Dream Xanarkand named Jekt became an accomplished Blitzball player and eventually had a son named Titus. Jekt appears brash and uncaring, and Titus grows to resent him. Despite his flaws, Jack means well and criticizes his son with the hope of making him stronger. Eventually, Jack grew fond of alcohol, and his addiction threatened his blitzball career. Instead of retiring, though, he set out to the sea to train for a return to his profession. There, he encountered Sin, who was swimming in the nearby waters. When Jack touched the monster, he transformed into a real human and was carried to Spira, where he washed ashore near Bavel. Though he lacked any understanding of how or why he was taken from his home, Jack's mysterious disappearance made him into a legendary figure in Dream Xanarkand. There, he's placed upon a giant billboard and an annual Blitzball tournament is held in his honor. In Spira, he became viewed as an insane drunkard and was imprisoned in Bavel. In Bavel, a priest named Braska had a daughter named Yuna, the product of he and an Albed wife. When his union with an Albed woman was discovered, he was cast out of the clergy. Ten years before the events of the game, Braska visited the imprisoned Jekt and eventually requested that he become one of his guardians in a pilgrimage to defeat Sin and bring about a new calm. Alongside them would be Orin, a former warrior monk of Yevon who at first objected to Jekt's presence. Before leaving for their mission, Jekt told Yuna stories about his home of Dream Xanarkand. At the outset of their travels, Jekt's recklessness got the group in trouble and jeopardized the pilgrimage. Nevertheless, he eventually matured, gave up drinking, and learned more about Spira and the destruction of Xanarkand. Along the way, he recorded messages and left them behind for Titus, should he ever find his way to Spira. Even though he has trouble expressing his feelings, Jack loves his son and means well. When the three reach Xanarkand ruins, the endpoint of the pilgrimage, 
Braska prepared to begin summoning the final Aeon. In the process, however, he learned that it could only be created through the sacrifice of one of his guardians. At that point, Jekt insisted upon sacrificing himself and becoming the final Aeon, saying that it would bring meaning to his life. Orin protested, but Jekt answered that he would try to find a way to destroy Sin permanently and break the cycle of its return after a calm. Braska reluctantly agreed, and asked Orin to watch over Yuna to ensure her future would be a happy one. In addition, Jekt asked Orin to watch over Titus, believing he may someday find a route into Dream Xanarchand. At peace with his decision, Jekt submitted to becoming the final Aeon. When he was summoned by Braska, Sin was defeated, but Yu Yevon's spirit possessed Jekt and became the core of a new Sin. Orin couldn't accept Braska and Jekt's sacrifice, so he confronted Unaleska himself. She struck him down with her immense power, and with the last of his energy, he died while crawling down Mount Gagazet. There, he left Yuna in the care of Kamari Ronso. His loyalty still bound to the mortal realm because of his responsibilities, Orin failed to enter the Far Plane and remained unsent. Though he struggles to fight Sin's instincts, Jekt used the last of his own control over the beast to carry Orin to Dream Xanarchand. After he arrived, Orin watched over Titus, who followed in his father's footsteps to become a star blitzball player for the Xanarchand Abes. And now, the events of the game begin. Ten years after Jack disappeared, Dream Xanarchand remains a bustling metropolis. Titus makes his way to the local stadium for an annual blitzball tournament named in his father's honor. Along the way, he's trailed by a faith. After signing autographs for adoring fans, he glances at a giant sign featuring the likeness of his father, who he remains bitter toward. Pushing his way through hordes of fans, Titus makes his way into the stadium. As the game begins, Orin stands high above the city as a catastrophe is about to unfold. As Titus plays his hardest in a game, a giant anomaly begins to loom over Dream Xanarchand. Suddenly, giant buildings are sucked upward into its form. The monstrosity fires beams of energy that completely destroy other structures, and everyone is forced into a panic. Titus runs out of the stadium, where he sees Orin, who he knows as an old friend of his father. As he runs out onto the walkway, the Faith tells him, it begins. Orin informs him that the threat to the city is called Sin, and the creature begins to emit enemies that launch into the walkway. As the two confront them, Orin gives Titus a blade, and tells him that it's a gift from Jack. The two fight past the enemies and eventually make their way to a collapsing platform. In the heights of the city, Orin pulls Titus up, and Sin begins to siphon everything from the city. As he does, Orin asks if Sin is sure. Ultimately, the two are drawn into the void, and Orin declares that it all begins here. After swimming through the projection of Dream Xanarchan, Titus sees the likeness of his father. He awakens in an array of gloomy, destroyed ruins. As he enters a nearby building, he's almost swallowed by a gigantic sea creature, but he defeats it in order to make his escape. In the center structure, he builds a fire and falls asleep. He has a vision of Orin and the Faith that was following him earlier, but is awakened to a brand new threat. A stealthy creature runs around the room and jumps down to challenge him. As he does though, a group of Albed bursts through the nearby entryway, and among them is a woman who helps Titus overcome the beast. After the battle, Titus is taken captive and soon realizes the group speaks a language he cannot understand. He is taken to their salvaging vessel where he learns that their leader can translate for him. He is soon forced to work for them and she travels with him to the ruins below. After the two defeat some enemies, they successfully salvage a sunken airship. The woman introduces herself as Riku. She says the group are out bed and wonders if Titus has amnesia. After he explains how he and Orin were sucked away from their home, she says Sin destroyed Xanarkand a thousand years ago. Shocked and confused, Titus insists he saw it unfold before his own eyes. Riku agrees to take him to Luka, where Blitzball is popular and he may be recognized by someone. Titus also learns that Xanarkand is considered a holy location by Yevon, and should not generally be spoken of. As the salvage vessel sails along the water, Sin passes by it knocking Titus off the boat and sweeping him away in the current. Titus awakens on the island of Besaide, where he's hit by a blitz ball from the local team. In impressive fashion, he kicks the ball back to the group, and they all wonder which team he plays for. He's then introduced to Waka, the captain of the Besaide Aurochs. He informs Titus that Sin destroyed all cities in Spira that used Machina technology long ago. This was interpreted as a sign of punishment for violating the doctrine of Yevon, which prohibits the use of Machina. 
Titus is invited to play in the upcoming Blitzball tournament, where all teams in Spira will congregate. After learning the Aurochs have failed to win a single game in a long time, Titus advises Waka to work on building confidence among the team. In Besaid, Titus also becomes aware of the Crusaders, a group dedicated to driving sin away from civilization. At the local temple, he is told that the true task of overcoming sin belongs to summoners, who take part in a legendary pilgrimage to summon a final Aeon to defeat it. While taking a nap, Titus has another dream of his childhood, where he has a total disregard for his father's disappearance. Titus soon becomes aware that Waka is a guardian who helps protect summoners along their pilgrimage. They enter the local Cloister of Trials, where summoners travel to pray. At the end, they eventually reach two other guardians, the Ronso Kamari and the Black Mage Lulu. There, a young summoner named Yuna, Braska's daughter, emerges in a weakened state from the Cloister after having overcome its challenge. Having accomplished the initial step in her path as a summoner, she now commands the power of Valifer, her first Aeon. Titus introduces himself to Yuna and encourages her to continue her journey as a summoner. She asks him to tell her more about Xanarkand on the boat they both plan to take the next day. That night, he has another dream where his disdain for his father is recalled once more. When Titus awakens, he overhears Lulu and Waka discussing Chapu, Waka's brother and crusader who was killed by Sin. After the Blitzball tournament, Waka plans to retire from Blitzball and become a full-time guardian. Titus thanks him for all of his help so far. The next day, he gives Titus Chapu's sword and explains the calm, sin sedentary period of regeneration. Kamari soon confronts Titus to test his aptitude in battle. After sparring, they embark for Kalika, where there's a summoner temple. On the boat, Titus and Yuna discuss their past. Titus discovers that Yuna knew a man named Jack when she was young because he was her father's guardian. Titus doubts his father was the same Jack, but he's startled to learn that Yuna first met him almost exactly around the time he vanished. In that moment, Sin abruptly plunges from the sea, shaking the boat wildly with its power. Waka orders the crew to fire its harpoons at the beast's fin. They do so, latching it to the boat. The group attacks the fin, but Sin pushes through to Kalika, where it unleashes utter destruction on the port. At this point, Titus begins to accept that he won't be going back home. As they reach shore, Yuna performs a sending ritual to ensure that the souls of those that died in Sin's attack reach the far plane. Afterward, Yuna expresses her desire to make Titus one of her guardians, but Waka and Lulu are reluctant to permit it. On the way to the temple, a Sin spawn attacks, but Titus and the group are able to overcome it. Just outside the temple, the Besaid Aurochs are also taunted by the arrogant Luka Goers, a rival Blitzball team from Spira. Inside, they also meet Donna, another summoner who is rude toward Yuna and the group. Nevertheless, she is also equally committed to defeating Sin. In addition, Titus learns that the Faith are the souls of those who willingly gave their lives to defeat Sin, and are beckoned by summoners as Aeons. After Yuna prays in the temple, she emerges once again in a weakened state. Titus recognizes the Hymn of the Faith, a song that glorifies Yevon, as a song that also existed in the Xanarchand he knew. Now that Yuna can command Ifrit, a new Aeon, they all set sail for the Blitzball tournament in Luka. On the way, Yuna reveals that in her youth, Jekt also told her stories of Xanarkand. While contemplating the upcoming game, Titus recalls failing at Blitzball in his youth and being ridiculed by his father. In the present day, he uses the Jekt shot to launch the Blitzball into the air from the boat. After witnessing the skill, Yuna says that Jekt showed her the same move long ago and comes to believe Titus's recollections. As they arrive in Luka, inhabitants of the city flock to the tournament in excitement. As the teams are introduced, word arrives that Maester Micah, the leader of Spira, has arrived for the occasion from Bavel. As Titus and the group go to greet him, they become aware that Seymour Guado, ordained Maester of Yevon, and son of the late Jiskel Guado, has come to Luka. He glances briefly at Yuna before passing by. At the tournament, the Aurochs are seated, and only require one win to make it to the championship game. While they're preparing, Yuna tells Titus that Orin has been spotted near Luka. Titus wonders whether the Orin he knows is the same one that was spotted, but sets out to find him. In addition, he teaches Yuna to whistle in the case the two are ever separated. Kamari is bullied by other Ronso in the nearby bar. Just as he defends himself, the tournament begins and Titus is late for the game. To their surprise, the party finds out that Yuna was kidnapped by the Albed Sykes in an attempt to blackmail the Aurochs into tanking the game. Titus, Lulu, and Kamari then set out to save her while Waka leads the Aurochs. 
After defeating some enemies, Yuna is saved from her Albed captors. When Yuna learns that Titus was rescued by a different group of Albed earlier, she asks if he met a man named Sid, her uncle. Titus then comes to the realization that Yuna is half Albed, and Lulu insists that he hide that information from Waka because he greatly dislikes the tribe. In the game, Waka and the Oroks manage to squeak out a narrow victory and move on to the championship. When the group reunites, Titus returns to the Oroks, and Lulu is relieved to see Waka again. Meanwhile, Oron approaches the city as the tournament continues. In the championship match, Titus makes a spectacular impression upon the crowd with a jack shot. At the end of the game though, he sits out, allowing Waka to lead the team and put the final nail in the coffin of the Luka goers. Despite their historical losing streak, the Besaid Oroks win the tournament. Just as the final game ends though, monsters suddenly enter the stadium and swarm the area. After Titus and Waka defeat a group, Luka's inhabitants hurriedly run from the danger. In that moment though, Oren arrives just in the nick of time. The fallen warrior monk summons his strength once again to defeat one of the beasts. Along with Titus, Waka recognizes Oren as well, and describes him as the best guardian there ever was. Titus and Waka join with him to defeat another enemy, but they are soon surrounded by many more. Among the turmoil, Seymour begins to summon an Aeon. A giant anchor then plunges into the structure, and the incredible power of Anima is revealed. With its unworldly might, the Aeon easily disposes of the remaining enemies. Luca's spectators look on in amazement, and Seymour is hailed as a savior. Yuna in particular is astonished by the Aeon's power. Waka hands the Crystal Cup to his teammates and retires from Blitzball as he intended. Titus blames Oren for bringing him to Spira and demands answers from him. Oren admits knowing Jekt and Braska and reveals their triumph over Sin to Titus. He says he watched over Titus and brought him to Spira at Jekt's request. More significantly, he makes the startling revelation that Sin is Jekt. In utter shock, Titus refuses to believe it. Regardless, Oren says that it's the truth and that Titus' best option is to follow him. Despite his verbal frustration, Titus rejoins the group with Oren. To their surprise, Oren volunteers to be Yuna's guardian to fulfill a request from Braska, but insists that Titus become one as well as an obligation to Jack. In contrast to what he told Titus, Oren tells Yuna he isn't sure if Jack is dead and hasn't seen him in 10 years. Yuna attempts to cheer Titus up while he's downtrodden the two share a laugh together. Their next destination is Jose, where there's another temple. On the way, a follower of Yevon explains that the Crusaders plan to use Machina in their next campaign against Sin, even though it's forbidden by the religion. Titus asks Yuna why Sin keeps returning after each calm, and wonders how it can be defeated for good. Yuna tells him the triumph over Sin relies upon the final summoning, the ultimate goal of a summoner's pilgrimage where the final Aeon is summoned against the monstrosity in Xanarchand. After being given a primer to decipher the Albed language, Titus and the group are obstructed by the local Chocobo Eater. However, they band together and successfully overcome the beast, making an impression upon the locals. In return, Rin gives the party a Chocobo so they can make their way to the end of the road. At a checkpoint, they run into the Crusaders planning the upcoming Operation Mihen against Sin. Surprisingly, Seymour passes through the area, and demands that the Crusaders allow Yuna and her guardians through. As they come to find out, Seymour is leading the operation, which comes as a surprise because it involves the use of Machina and an alliance with the Albed. For the cause of defeating Sin, the enigmatic maester requests that the group look past the means they plan to use. Even so, Waka wants nothing to do with the scheme and accuses Seymour of blasphemy. At the outpost, Waka also learns that his brother Chapu was once planning to complete a Blitzball game and propose to Lulu afterward, but was recruited into the Crusaders and died at the hands of Sin instead. As a result, he has an outburst of anger against the Crusader who persuaded him to enlist, and has to be held back by Titus. Before the Machina operation is executed, Wen Kinok, one of the four maesters of Yevon, expresses a belief that the Machina campaign against Sin will be unsuccessful. Because of past differences, Oren and Wen Kinok have a strained relationship, leading to tensions between them. In order to draw Sin to them, Sin spawns are used as bait, and Titus and the group keep one occupied in combat for a time. As expected, Sin approaches through the sea and reveals its giant form. 
The Crusaders fire a barrage of Machina artillery at the beast while the Chocobo Knights charge the Sin spawn on the beach. Despite their attempt to annihilate the monster, Sin unleashes a giant wave of energy that rips through the beach, utterly vaporizing everything upon it, including the Chocobo Knights. Despite the setback, Seymour joins the party and helps destroy another Sin spawn. As a last-ditch attempt to stop Sin from destroying everything in the area, the Albed fire a giant cannon directly upon the creature. It fails to pierce Sin's shield, and Sin manages to deflect the energy back to destroy the cannon. Nevertheless, the effort successfully convinces the beast to turn away and leave the area. Yuna wishes to summon an Aeon to battle Sin, but Seymour warns that her powers are still too weak to affect it. As he swims out into the ocean to follow Sin, Titus recalls his father's alcoholism. Seymour encourages Yuna to continue her pilgrimage until Sin is defeated. Orin tells Titus that Sin came to their location for a reason, so that Titus would be convinced to stop him. Until he does, Orin says he will continue killing. Orin also tells Titus not to share what he knows about Sin and Jack with Yuna, because doing so would only cause her to distance herself from him. When they all arrive at the Jose Temple, fellow summoner Isaru reveals that several summoners have recently gone missing and advises caution. Yuna successfully navigates through the Cloister of Trials and as a result, gains the power of Ixion as a new Aeon. Near the Moonflow River, the group encounters a Shoepuff, a giant creature that can travel through water. Orin informs Titus that Jack once attacked the same creature in a drunken stupor, but quit drinking entirely after doing so. While using the Shoepuff to cross the river, the group observes an ancient Machina city that resides under the water. Yuna is abruptly kidnapped by an Albed that pulls her underwater. In response, Titus and Waka swim down to destroy the Machina holding her captive, and the group returns to the surface. Because of the experience, the group concludes that it must be the Albed that's responsible for the recent disappearance of summoners. When they reach the other side of the river, Titus encounters an Albed woman lying near the shore. As it turns out, it's Riku, the same Albed operative that helped him earlier. As he comes to find out, it was actually Riku who kidnapped Yuna on the way across the river. Titus reluctantly reveals that she's an Albed, which surprises the group, but Waka doesn't realize it. Lulu, Yuna, and Riku have a discussion, and with Warren's approval, the summoner decides to make Riku a guardian. The travelers soon arrive at Guado Salam, the home of Seymour and gateway to the far plane. The group is told the Maester has personal business with Yuna, so they meet up with him. As they soon learn, Seymour is the product of a Guado father and human mother, and that his father, Jiskal Guado, spread the teachings of Yevon to the Guado people. Inside, Seymour reveals a sphere created from the thoughts of the dead in the far plane. In the image, the group observes Xanarkand at the height of its civilization, which is similar to the one Titus remembers. He also shows Yuna visions of Yuna Leska, who used to live in Xanarkand and was the first summoner to defeat Sin. It was only through her strong bond to Xeon, he says, that allowed her to accomplish such an arduous feat. In the same moment, Seymour proposes to marry Yuna, such that the two can unite in the same mission and overcome Sin together. Yuna is surprised, but Seymour allows her some time to decide. Orin warns that Yuna cannot be diverted from her mission, but he persists in his request. As they walk away, Seymour says he's keen to the scent of the far plane, and wonders why Orin is still among them. Yuna's torn with the decision because she thinks marrying Seymour may help the people of Spira, but also expresses doubts as well. The summoner resolves to travel to the Far Plane to seek the advice of her father. Before entering, Orin decides not to enter with the rest of them. There, Pyreflies form images of Yuna's parents, who she converses with. Waka also talks with his brother, Chapu. Lulu also makes peace with his death and commits her focus to life as it is instead. Yuna suggests that Titus and Vision jacked, but he knows he won't appear anyway because he's still alive as Sin. He then recalls his past once more, and realizes that he blames his father's disappearance for the death of his mother. Eventually, Yuna arrives at her answer for Seymour, though she doesn't reveal it to the group. As they all leave the far plane, a vision of Lord Jiskal appears. The incident brings Orin into a weakened state, and he instructs Yuna to send him. She does so, but he drops a sphere that she picks up. Orin remarks that Jiskal must have remained unsent because he died an unclean death. When Yuna attempts to give her answer to Seymour, she learns that he is left for the temple at Makalania. The group decides to head there. Making their way through the Thunder Plains, they stop to rest at Rin's travel agency. While Yuna is in her room, Titus overhears a man speaking from within it. 
As he leans upon the door to listen in, he stumbles and falls inside. As he does, Yuna is in the process of viewing the sphere showing Seymour's deceased father, Jiskel. According to her, the message was his will, and said to take care of his son. Just before the group enters the Makalania woods, Yuna informs them that she intends to accept Seymour's marriage proposal. She says the decision will be the best thing for Spira's future and Yevon's unity. Oren requests to see the sphere, but Yuna refuses because she says it's a personal matter. However, she reiterates that she is willing to continue her pilgrimage and face sin. Oren hopes that Yuna plans to use the marriage as grounds to negotiate with Seymour. In the Makalania woods, Donna's guardian warns that she has recently gone missing. Inside an overgrown path, the group is confronted by a fiend called Spheromorph. When it's defeated, it drops a sphere left behind by Jekt and reveals recordings from Braska's pilgrimage. As it turns out, Jekt began his tenure as a guardian in the same brash fashion Titus remembers. It also contains a personal message to Titus in the case that he ever made it to Spira. Though he struggles to express it, it is clear that he cares for his son's well-being and aptitude to overcome challenges. After the message, Oren notes that Jekt grew to accept his fate, and realized he would never return again to the Xanarchand he knew. Instead, he gained greater understanding of Spira and Braska's resolve, and eventually committed himself to helping the summoner overcome sin. After hearing Yuna's decision, Seymour's butler Tramal intends to bring Yuna to the Makalania Temple, where the Maester is located. Before they can leave though, they are ambushed by a group of Albed, including Riku's brother, and a giant Machina crawler. When it's defeated, Waka discovers that Riku is an Albed as well, triggering his anger. In resentment, he condemns the Albed for violating Yevon's teachings. Without support from the group, he walks away himself. Meanwhile, the party travels to the Makalania temple by way of the Machina sleds left behind. When the group arrives, they discover that Yuna has gone to the Cloister of Trials with Seymour. Meanwhile, Titus and the others find the sphere left behind by Jiskel earlier. As they learn, the sphere communicates Jiskel's dire warning about his son. According to Jiskel, Seymour murdered him in a thirst for power, and has been using Yevon, the Guado, and even summoners to feed his own ambition. If he's not stopped, the message says, it will bring destruction and chaos to Spira. The group then confronts Seymour outside of the Chamber of the Faith. Just as they do, Yuna returns from the trial in a weakened state again, and Titus and the group reveals they view Jiskel's sphere. When Seymour asks why Yuna came, she says she did so to stop him. Joining with their guardian, Seymour is killed with the help of Yuna's newly acquired Aeon, Shiva. Now an unsent, Trommel carries the Maester's body away before he can be sent to the far plane. Titus and the group are now branded traitors, and Trommel destroys the sphere so there's no evidence against Seymour. The party begins to flee, and in the process, Guado's soldiers pursue them through the icy fields. Eventually, they are stopped by a yeti fiend. In defeat, it stomps the icy ground beneath it, sending Titus and his friends into a pit. Now under Lake Makalania, Yuna tells the group she intended to convince Seymour to turn himself into Yevon's judgment. Oren says that focusing on the pilgrimage and defeating Sin should be Yuna's primary focus. He asserts that they all need to help bring that aim to fruition, even if they must defy Yevon in the process. This is because the faith grant power to summoners, not Yevon or its teachings. The group decides to make Yevon's cultural center of Bavel their next destination. As they prepare, Titus and Oren notice the hymn of the faith emanating from the nearby temple, a song Jekt used to love. Oren confirms that he was brought to Xanarkin by Sin, making the monstrosity the link between Titus' homeland and Spira. Titus then realizes that if Sin is destroyed, he will never return. When the singing stops, the ground begins to rumble intensely. As it turns out, the party landed upon Sin in a docile state, who was attracted to the Hymn of the Faith. Titus comes to believe for sure that Jekt is indeed Sin, and knows he wants Spira's cycle of destruction to come to an end. Titus awakens on Beaconel Island, where he gathers together his fellow guardians, but no one can find Yuna. Riku guides the party to the Albed City of Home, an underground fortress. Guado forces are attacking the city, so Titus and the others fight their way through the invasion. In the process, they meet Sid, father of Riku and leader of the Albed. Inside the fortress, Titus learns that the captured summoners were taken from the Albed and placed inside the Summoner Sanctum to protect them. Donna and Isaru, who are in the Sanctum, 
indicate that Yuna isn't inside and that many summoners sacrifice themselves to save the others. Titus argues that guardians exist to protect the summoners and questions why they're being held there. Riku reluctantly answers that pilgrimages have to stop. If they don't, she says, summoners that consummate their pilgrimage will be killed at Xanarkand. This means that if Yuna manages to summon the final Aeon and defeat Sin, it will destroy her as well. Riku says the process is immoral and believes that summoners should be saved from such a tragic fate. When Titus realizes that everyone else already knows this cold reality, he has a nervous breakdown and lashes out at the others for keeping him in the dark. In the midst of the chaos around him, Titus thinks of laughing together with Yuna. He awakens, refusing to allow her to die and resolving to find her. The group boards the Fahrenheit, the same airship Titus and Riku salvaged when they first met. Titus tracks down Sid and demands his help to find Yuna. Enraged at his intentions, he slams Titus into the ground. Nevertheless, he insists he will find a way to save her from death. Sid agrees to use the airship to help search and launches it into the air from its underground hangar. Before they leave the area, Sid commands his forces to fire its Machina weaponry upon Hull. They do so, wrecking the fortress and destroying the Guado forces in the process. Afterward, the Albed crew has located Yuna. As it turns out, she has been taken by the unsent Seymour to the Palace of St. Pavel, where she is about to be married to him. Admiring Titus' guts, Sid sets course for the location. On top of the airship, they fight their way past Evre, Bethel's guardian worm. Afterward, the airship approaches the city itself. As the ceremony takes place in Bethel, Seymour and Yuna are seen strolling down the walkway as Yevon's forces look on. The Fahrenheit swoops down upon the city, and Bethel's forces fire upon it. Seymour attempts to escape with Yuna, but the airship deploys clamps that latch onto the platforms. Titus and the others slide down the ropeways and confront the soldiers. As they are overwhelmed and surrounded by Wen Keenock, Yuna attempts to send Seymour, but is stopped by Maester Micah's threat to kill her guardians if she does. Yuna stands down, and the ritual continues as Seymour kisses her. He orders them all killed regardless, but before they can do so, Yuna tells them all to run and throws herself over the ledge. In the process, she summons Valifor to dive through the air and catch her as she falls. Riku uses a flash bomb to divert Seymour's attention, and they all head to the Chamber of the Fate. Waka grows disillusioned by Yevon as the Maesters themselves are using forbidden Machina weapons and devices. Making their way through the Cloister of Trials and into the Room of the Faith, Titus finds Yuna standing before the same spirit that followed him through Xanarkin the day Sin arrived. As Orin explains, the Faith are souls of those who gave their lives to Yevon, and join with summoners to create Aeons. The Faith merges with Yuna, giving her command of the Aeon Bahamut. As Titus carries Yuna out of the chamber though, the group is detained by Wen Keenock. They are soon put on trial by the Maesters as traitors. Presiding is Kelk Ronzo, who charges the group with injuring Seymour and conspiring to engage in insurrection against Yevon. Yuna reveals it was actually Seymour that betrayed Yevon by murdering his father, and he confirms the accusation. Furthermore, she explains that Seymour is already dead, and asks Maester Micah to send him to the far plane per his duty. Surprisingly, Micah responds by chuckling, refusing Yuna's request, and revealing that he too is unsent. The other Maesters make excuses for their hypocritical behavior, and Micah says that Sin can never be truly defeated. Instead, he asserts that it's actually the duty of Yevon to continue the cycle of death through sin and give people hope while the Maesters maintain power. With Yevon's hypocrisy exposed completely, Oren laments the spiral of death that consumes Spira. Titus and the group are sentenced to Via Perifico, an inescapable dungeon. Meanwhile, the Maesters imply that Kelk Ronzo has left Yevon, angered by Seymour's murder of his own father. Seymour volunteers to kill Yuna and the others, and Wen Keenock decides to join him. After finding Lulu, Kamari, and Orin, Yuna is stopped by Isaru, who confronts the group for their traitorous behavior. When he is defeated, the Guardians all reunite with Yuna. Just as they do though, Seymour arrives. He reveals that he took the opportunity to kill Wen Keenock, accusing him of petty schemes and fear. Shockingly, he declares that he will perpetuate Spira's death spiral by taking Yuna to Xanarkand and using her power to become the next Sin. Facing resistance from the group, Seymour transforms himself into a powerful being and attacks the party, but they are able to overcome him once again. 
After escaping Bavel, Titus realizes that Yuna's faith has been shaken by the experience with Yevon. In the Makalania woods, he attempts to comfort her. There, he even encourages her to forget about sin and give up her pilgrimage in favor of a normal life. Initially, she contemplates doing so, but ultimately decides against it, breaking into tears. Titus kisses her in the water, alleviating her distress. Yuna intends to continue her journey, and Titus promises to remain by her side. The group continues through the Calm Lands, where they enter the Remium Temple, once a great religious center before the Machina War. In the Cavern of the Stolen Faith, they stumble across Yojimbo, who offers his service as an Aeon to Yuna for the right price. From there they head onward to Mount Gagazet, home of the Ronso. They are stopped there by Maester Kelk, who left Yevon in disgust but still refuses to allow the party to travel through the sacred mountain. Showing her zeal for the cause, Yuna insists she has cast aside Yevon and says she will bring about a new calm for Spira regardless. Now persuaded by her commitment, Kelk opens the mountains to them so they can proceed to Xanarkand. Despite the welcome, Kamari is still pestered by the Ronso that bullied him in Luka. Baran and Yanka, who stop him from passing through the mountain. Titus learns that long ago, Baran broke off part of Kamari's horn, so he left the village in disgrace. Now, he stands up against them to prove his strength and instructs Titus to stay back. He manages to defeat them both, who take the loss in stride, and Baran proclaims Kamari's triumph. Baran also agrees to stop Yevon's pursuers from catching up with the group. As they travel through the icy cliffs, the group finds a memory sphere for Yuna left behind by Braska. He tells Yuna that the future is hers to make, and that she should live the way she wants to. At the mountain's heights, the group is surprised to be stopped by Seymour, who boasts that he already killed most of the Ronzo in the area. Seymour commands Yuna to come with him to Xanarkin so that he can fulfill his aim of becoming Sin and destroying Spira. He also lets slip that Jekt would be freed when he becomes the next Sin. Before Titus can strike him down, he transforms into Seymour Flux and attacks the group. Despite his power, they are able to vanquish him once again. After the battle, Titus explains to everyone that Sin is actually his father, though he doesn't know how it came to be. With this in mind, Yuna is surprised that Titus would continue on the pilgrimage regardless, but he says fighting against his father is no problem for him. On the cliffs, the group stumbles upon a giant wall of faith that has been preserved through the ages. According to Yuna, someone is drawing energy from it. As he touches the wall, Titus gets swept into what seems to be a dream, and finds himself back in the Xanarkandi nose. Just as he gazes out at the city from his home, he sees the faith that once followed him sitting inside. Instead of experiencing a dream, the faith says that Titus himself is a dream. He explains that the Xanarkand he knows was the result of the Machina War with Bavel, and that faith preserves Xanarkand, and all those inhabiting it, as dreams. Even so, because Jekt and Titus have been touched by sin, the faith says that they have grown beyond mere dreams. He adds that the faith are growing tired of preserving Xanarkand, and hopes Titus will be the dream to end all of their dreaming. When he awakens, Titus and the group approach Xanarkand. Orin warns that Unaleska will summon fiends to test the group's strength. Nevertheless, he says Braska would be proud of Yuna because she isn't frightened of what lies ahead. They finally reach the ruins of the true Xanarkand, a once mighty city in the last chapter of the journey. From a memory sphere dropped by Yuna, Titus learns of her true love and feelings for all her guardians. On the outskirts of Xanarkand, the party sits beside a fire while Titus stares out into the ancient city. Within the ruins, Pyreflies construct images from past pilgrimages. In the process, they witness moments from Braska's pilgrimage where Orin and Jack plead with the summoner to reconsider his decision. The images also recall Seymour's pilgrimage with his mother, who once volunteered to become his final Aeon so that Sin could be defeated. After learning that the summoner and final Aeon will join powers, the party eventually reaches Unaleska, the first summoner to overcome Sin. She promises the final summoning to Yuna, but requires her to select one of her guardians to become the final Aeon. The final summoning requires a strong bond between Chosen and Summoner. Once the Guardian is selected, the group is shocked to learn that the Summoner's life will end, and the Chosen Guardian will be killed in the process of annihilating Sin. Through the Pyreflies, the party discovers that it was Jack who volunteered to be Braska's final Aeon, despite the pleadings of Orin to find another way to defeat Sin. Jack promised his friend that he would search for a way to break the cycle of the monster's return. 
it now becomes clear to the group that in the process of Braska's summoning, he managed to destroy Sin, but also became the next one. Lulu volunteers to be called upon as the final Aeon, but Titus, like his father before him, insists on finding a way to break the cycle. Unaleska confirms that there is no way to do so, and that Sin can only be vanquished through the final Aeon. Yevon's doctrine of atonement was merely a ruse to keep the cycle going. They witness a vision of a younger and impulsive Orin, who ran forward and attempted to strike Unaleska down before taking a mortal blow himself. When asked again to choose a final Aeon, Yuna chooses no one. Instead, the entire group resolves to defy fate and condemn the final summoning as a false tradition. In opposition to their decision, Unaleska attacks the group. With their combined strength, they are able to overcome her, and in so doing, have eliminated the sole catalyst of the final summon. As she fades away, she warns that even if they're able to eliminate Sin another way, Yu Yevon would only create a new one in its place. After the battle, Orin reveals to Titus that he too is unsent, struck down by Unaleska ten years ago. Before he died, he managed to instruct Kamari to protect Yuna, and traveled upon Sin to dream Xanarkand. Jekt asked him to watch over Titus, and he gave his word to do so. As he leaves the ruins of Xanarkand, Sin is sitting outside, peering down at Titus. He promises his father that he'll find another way, and the Fahrenheit flies past him. While the group contemplates a new plan to confront Sin, they decide to track down answers from Maester Micah in Vavel. Also, the party comes to the conclusion that the Hymn of the Faith may be the key to subduing Sin, because Jack was always fond of the song. When they reach Bavel, the party is treated as infidels by the guards, but Shalinda, who is now their captain, informs them that Lady Yuna is not to be harmed. When they reach Micah, the maester has assumed Yuna has obtained the final Aeon. When he learns that they killed Unaleska instead, he is shocked. Believing they have profaned and subverted the tradition, he loses hope that a new calm can ever be obtained again. Before fading away to the far plane, he reveals that Yu Yevon crafts the souls of the dead into unholy armor, Sin, making him invincible. The Faith Bahamut expounds that if Yu Yevon is defeated, the cycle of destruction will end. He adds that when the final Aeon is summoned, Yu Yevon merges with it. Consequently, if the party can find a way to enter Sin and defeat the summoner himself, they may be able to bring an end to the cycle. Even though Yuna knows Titus is hiding something, he shrugs her off. On their way out, the group asks Shalinda to encourage Spira's people to join in the Hymn of the Faith so that Sin can be brought into a docile state. Making a stop at Baj Temple, they enter the Room of the Faith. Inside is the soul of Seymour's mother, who admits that Seymour sowed the seeds of hatred long ago. As they find out, her desire to give Seymour strength once led them to take a pilgrimage to Xanarkin together. When she agreed to become his final Aeon, Seymour only thirsted for more power. Instead of using the final Aeon against Sin, he took Anima for himself. She bestows to Yuna the Dark Aeon Anima and asks the group to use it to destroy Sin. They also return to Remium Temple where they break the seal on the temple's back door to enter a new chamber. Within, they find the Magus sisters, who also give their power as Aeons to Yuna. The Hymn of the Faith is broadcasted throughout Spira, which seems to put Sin at ease. Sid intends to use the ship's weapons to get the group inside, so they approach with the Fahrenheit. When they do so, however, Sin unleashes an incredible volley of shots that rip through the surface of Spira. In response, Sid orders the deployment of the Fahrenheit's cannon. With the weapon, the ship makes two direct hits, both of which break off Sin's arms before the cannon becomes dysfunctional. Titus and the group takes the opportunity to jump onto Sin and attack its weak point. Afterward, Sin is weakened and goes into freefall. In a grand display, it crashes down into the water near Bavel. In a discussion with Titus, Yuna realizes that the Aeons can be used to lure Yu Yevon out of Sin before he can merge with the final Aeon, providing a possible strategy to defeat the Ancient Summoner. Yuna realizes Yu Yevon is summoning something, and Titus confirms it is the Dream of the Faith, of which he is a part. After a time, Sin regains some of its strength and jumps out of the water, latching itself to the pinnacle of Bavel. Sid orders the crew to bring the Fahrenheit right to its mouth. As they get closer, Sin begins to fly again, and the party fights the beast head on. Eventually, it opens its giant mouth and the airship is pulled forward into it, along with the crew. Within Sin, the group finds Seymour, who has been absorbed by the beast. Still consumed by his obsession with Sin, he says he will use the opportunity to control the world. 
he takes yet another powerful form, Seymour Omnis, and attacks the group. Devoted to his undoing, the party is able to defeat him once again. In a watershed moment, Yuna sends him to the far plane just as he boasts that Spear's sorrow will still prevail. In the core of Sin, Titus comes face to face with Jekt, who says he's losing control of himself as he is about to turn fully into Sin. When Jack proposes to end it all, Titus declares that he hates him. Ready to get things over with, Jack begins to empower himself and walks backward. Despite an attempt by Titus to catch up with him, he falls off the side of the ledge. As he does so, their whole surroundings rumble and the image of Dream Xanarkin begins to illuminate around them. A giant hand reaches up to the ledge, revealing Jack in his final Aeon form. After a grueling fight, Titus and the others overcome Jekt, and the Aeon falls to the ground and explodes. Now back in human form, Titus comforts Jekt as he dies. When he tells his son to save his crying for later, Titus responds that they have a job to do. He urges the group to call forth the Aeons to destroy Yu Yevin, and fades away to the far plane. As Yu Yevin appears before them all, Yuna calls forth each of her Aeons one by one. As they appear, each Aeon is possessed by Yu Yevin and defeated. While Yu Yevin is in its parasitic form, Titus finally reveals to everyone that when the Ancient Summoner is defeated, he will disappear too because he is a dream of the faith. Still devoted to the task, he charges forward. The party joins together and fights the Summoner, who surrounds himself with protective pagodas. After a hard fight, Yu Yevin drifts upward and explodes, releasing immense rays of light. While this transpires, people from all around Spear gaze into the air, completely in awe. Realizing that Titus and his friends must have been successful at ending the death spiral, celebrations break out. In each of Spear's temples, Faith finally begin their slumber, no longer needing to dream at all. Atop the platform, Yuna sends Orin, who is ready to go to the far plane. As he fades away, he proclaims that Spear is theirs now. In defeat, Sin perishes in a giant explosion that surges through the sky. Meanwhile, Yuna sends all of her Aeons, and Titus notices he is beginning to fade as well. Atop the Fahrenheit, he tells Yuna he must leave, and apologizes he couldn't show her Xanarkand. Without wanting to prolong the goodbye, he walks forward, but Yuna runs up to Titus and falls right through him. In that moment, Yuna declares her love for him. Before fading away completely, he embraces her warmly. Walking forward, he lunges off the Fahrenheit, entering the far plane to the greeting of Braska, Orin, and Jekt, who he has now made peace with. Still distraught over the loss of Titus, Yuna speaks to a gigantic crowd assembled from all parts of Spira. She says she knows that everyone has lost something precious to them, but their struggle is ended and sin is gone. In a new Spira with an eternal calm, Yuna urges everyone never to forget the friends they have lost or the dreams that have faded. Shortly afterward, Titus awakens from a fetal position underwater and swims upward toward a source of light. If you like this storyline summary and remember Final Fantasy X, leave a comment below about the most memorable moment of the game to you. If you like my videos, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell below to be alerted upon the addition of new ones. Also, please consider supporting my channel via YouTube's Join feature to receive member exclusives, such as advanced videos and complete video transcripts.